Honest Andy's Discount Moon Show. Hello and welcome to Honest Andy's Discount Moon Show. My name is Andy and I'm here as ever with my co-host Rick. Hello. Hello. <laughs> this show we are going to talk about moon news featuring water on the moon. A UK firm has perfected how to get the oxygen out of moon rocks. A dead ringer for the moon could be lurking around Mars's orbit. Jupiter's moon of Europa has glow-in-the-dark ice. Some of the lost moons of Jupiter have been recovered. And of course we'll do full moon of the month and the next moon is, which this time will feature Themisto. And I'm going to start a brand new feature called Prime Moonister's Questions. But we shall end the show on that. So, first things first, Rick, how are you doing? Uh, I'm good, yes. Uh, enjoying lockdown once again. It's good to be back under more stringent conditions. I was finding the freedom to go out too, <laughs> too liberating. Uh, yeah, it's good to have the old agoraphobia back. You're so used to being indoors that outside it's like, oh, this is strange, I don't like it. Yes. The thing is, though, my wife said, oh, we, we've been under lockdown a week now. And I was like, well, have we? My life has not changed. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that is how much I go out anyway. So uh, yeah, uh, we're under we're under lockdown, but uh, I, I don't think I was I was I was really going out much anyway. Yeah, I uh, was going out to the pub with friends very occasionally. So it's basically me saying sorry, I can't go. I've got a moon video to make mode because the last video, Miranda, people would invite me out and I'd be saying, nope, I want to get this done, which just goes to show you how much of a sad hermit I have turned into somewhat. Even though this is the second lockdown, I'm so used to it. it just It's just kind of like rolling off my back at this point. I don't feel distressed. I don't feel angry. It's just cracking on. Yeah, it's like when they uh, pull down the Berlin Wall and some West German, no, East, the ones under communism were not too happy with their newfound freedoms. It's like, what? We have to find a job. What? You're not going to tell us what to do every day. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, and they, they just didn't, didn't adjust at all. So there's a term for this. It's called Ostalgia. Oh, right. Because Ost is German for East, so Ostalgia. And when uh, my wife was studying uh, for her OU degree, she had to go to a place in Germany called Jena. One of the projects was go out on the street and interview people about how they found life behind the Iron Curtain. How do they miss the Soviet Union? And a lot of people were saying, like, yeah, the streets were, weren't as busy. You always had a job. There was a, a sense of community that isn't here anymore. So... Nostalgia is a real thing, uh, to the point where when we went to Berlin for the 30th an anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, we stayed in a in a hotel called Ostel, which is converted to look like a Soviet block of flats. <laughs> and, uh, and, right. and the rooms were all decked out in wonderful 70s decor, just like East Germany. And it was delightful. Like I loved it. Did you get dragged away in the night if you complained about the hotel in any way, shape or form? <laughs> Well, they're onto a winner there in that hotel because anything that's genuinely broken, they can just say, no, 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 it's meant to be like that. It's the 1970s. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all in keeping with the aesthetic of the hotel. Hotel's meant to be on fire. <laughs> no, uh, not quite. My one complaint, though, was the shower was abysmal. It, it was like no pressure and you had to hold it up above your head. So I hated that shower. But the rest of it, the, it was just lovely and retro and they had one of the old radios uh, from like the 50s and we were just tuning into all modern radio stations which is quite cool uh, and for the 30th anniversary of the Berlin Wall they had a trabby parade outside the hotel. Uh, what's a trabby? A uh, trabby is it looks like Mr Bean's car but made under Soviet engineering, so as cheap as possible. <laughs> it's just too... You, you, you described a bad car and made it worse. <laughs> well, there's so many jokes uh, from the era of how bad Trabbies are. Like, I think they've got a 0.9cc engine, and I'm not kidding, the seats are stuffed with hay, or at least when <laughs> I was dr driving one, the seats were stuffed with hay. The doors are papier-mâché. Oh, the, the gear stick, it, it's like an American car where the gear stick is on the side of the, the wheel. And when you start it, this blue smoke just erupts from it. I've, I've got footage uh, that I'll, I'll insert into the YouTube video here. And I'll link it in the show notes if you want to see what, what the Trabby is like. But yeah, Trabbies are, are delightful and they're just like this collector's item now. Oh, great. I th think I remember you showing me videos, but for the purposes of the podcast, I pretended to forget. Oh, okay. Fair enough. You're doing a good job, every man. 
So what have you been up to? Uh, well, this month, my exciting thing is I've finished Lord of the Rings, the book. I was going to say the book or the film, because both are equally as long. Uh, yeah, no, the book. I've seen the films. They're, they're dead good. I'm surprised he wrote the book afterwards. Uh, it really, <laughs> re really, he's, ad he's added some stuff that really detract. I mean, what Tom Bombadil, what's that about? That's a nonsense character. Get rid of him. He is a nonsense character, and um, that that's one of the good decisions from the films of cutting him out. They were <laughs> long and bloated enough as it was. Epic, and I love them, but they made the right decision by cutting Tom Bombadil out. <laughs> But what is he? I did. I did look it up. up. Sorry, if, if people don't know, Tom Bombadil is a random character. Yeah, spoiler alert. In case you've not heard of Lord of the Rings, they get stuck in a tree near the beginning, and Tom Bombadil rescues them, sings a song, and then they go on their way. And then he's never really mentioned again. It's kind of like uh, Dungeons and Dragons, where you're on a quest. Oh no, you're stuck in a tree, but here comes a friendly neighbourhood hobbit, and it's kind of like meant to feel like that. I think. Yeah, I did. I did have to look up who is Tom Bombadil or what is he, and there's a few theories that he represents J.R.R. Tolkien or he represents the Earth or or stuff like that. But just from a plot point of view, he does nothing. Okay, that is clutching at straws. <laughs> I guess it's a bit like a uh, Stephen King writing himself in the novels, but he is explicitly Stephen King in those books, whereas J.R.R. Tolkien putting in Tom Bombadil representing himself is a little bit of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink, as opposed to, hello, I am Stephen King. Yes. All the theories seemed a bit weak anyway, so um, quite quite good the films got rid of him. But no, it was interesting to just read what was uh, good back then. And and they also missed out the end bit when, a spoiler alert, they destroy the ring at the end. Um, after they destroy the ring, in the films they all go back to the Shire and everything's fine. Whereas in the books they go back and there's ruffians messing up the place, and they're literally called the Ruffians. Oh. Which I, I think is a lovely 1950s. <laughs> uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the baddest gang name we can think of? <laughs> uh, the Ruffians. Well, the Jets and the Sharks were already taken. Well, that's it, yeah. You've only got um, <laughs> Ruffians left. And I don't think you can have the Jets anyway, because that's a new age technology, which Mid Middle Earth didn't have. Otherwise, it would make the whole journey a lot quicker. That's a good point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think the Ruffians are at the end of the the Hobbit films. I think they incorporate that bit into that trilogy. Yeah, I mean, I think it's to show a character arc that these lovely Hobbits go off and they're all sweet and innocent, and when they come back, they're happy to take on some Ruffians. But it was just like, uh, yeah, oh, come on, they've won a battle and taken on Sauron and all sorts. We don't need them having some minor fight. Oh yeah, this seems a bit underwhelming at this point. Yeah, but uh, it was interesting. Oh yeah. So, Lord of the Rings. I think it'll do well. <laughs> well, you talked about theories before. Do you think you're going to uh, try the Samarillion, Silmarillion? No, <laughs> is the answer. Is is that the one that goes into a lot of detail and less plot, as I recall, where it just sort of explains? Because um, the the back of the copy of Lord of the Rings I've got has got like four or five annexes of stuff from the Silmarillion explaining like every hierarchy of Bilbo Baggins or whatever, and it's just like okay, yeah, uh, Tolkien's invented this world, which is great, but this is kind of dull. <laughs> yeah, it is like that. It's like an en encyclopedia of okay, here is the law of this whole universe. Uh, again, CGP Grey has read it for us and condensed it into a lovely video, so you can watch that in 10 minutes rather than spending 10 weeks reading this very dense book. Yes, that was it. I've also seen that video and I thought, well, it's, his annexes aren't as fun as that video. Yes, so, exactly. <laughs> go and watch it. <laughs> well, speaking of videos, one of the reasons uh, why I do this podcast is to put more videos on the YouTube channel and talk about moon things. So, shall we talk about some moon things? Yep. Cool. Okay, we're going to start off with some moon news, and we're going to talk about water on the moon. Uh, what what on earth could you mean by that, Andy? That headline is so cryptic, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> well... Water has been discovered on the moon. Uh, water on the moon. I thought we covered this in like episode one, where I was surprised to some extent there was water on the moon, and you said no, no, there's there's some bits of water on like uh, you know in ice format because uh, it's very cold on the moon and that. So have they rediscovered it, or they were lying the first time, or what? So they haven't necessarily rediscovered it. They've confirmed that what they thought could be water 
is in fact water and also significantly more than what they thought was there. Ah, so it's it's more water on the moon. Yes, that should be the proper headline of more water discovered on the moon. But actually what is quite incredible about this is that it's discovered in a sunlit area of the moon, so in direct sunlight. Whereas before we've talked about ice in the craters, whereas this time it's actually on the sunny bit of the moon in direct sunlight, which gets up to like 100 degrees C on the moon. So it gets almost a boiling point, but they've still found water on the surface of the moon. So I don't know much about moons, as is my job on this show, but I know there aren't any astronauts wandering around. How did they find some water on the moon? Or sorry, how did they find more water on the moon? So there is a big plane with a telescope on it and it's called SOFIA, which is an acronym, as they always are, for Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. So this plane is at the very edge of the Earth's atmosphere not in space, but it's orbiting, not orbiting, it's flying within the atmosphere where it's a lot thinner and therefore you can see beyond the atmosphere, there's no atmospheric interference and they were looking at the moon. It's kind of like a, a test of the telescope and they did some infrared astronomy on the moon, a certain crater, and what was detected before was traces of hydrogen. Now this hydrogen was part of a molecule that could either be water, H2O, or a chemical relative called hydroxyl, which is OH. So they knew there was hydrogen, but they didn't know if this hydrogen was part of some other molecule or water. Well, this discovery has confirmed it's water that they're looking at. Good oh. So when you say there's more water, what sort of quantities are we looking at? Did we used to think there's one litre on the moon, now there's two? Or we used to think there's one litre and now there's four billion or something? So, so the measure they tend to use is something called parts per million. And million would be like molecules. So you get like a big scoop of molecules and you go, how many of a certain kind of molecule are in here? Now beforehand, the Lunar Prospector probe, which was launched in 1998, it found there was hydrogen at a about 50 parts per million. Out of the million elements, 50 were hydrogen. This discovery has found that there's 100 to 400 parts per million of water molecules. So that's roughly about 350 milliliter bottle of water per meter. So you've got, imagine a meter cube, and then within that meter cube, you've got a 330 mil bottle of water that's how much water is on the moon per metre cubed of the surface. That's quite a bit. That is quite a bit, but it, it is a hundred times less than the Sahara Desert. Yeah, I was going to say, does it, what can we compare that to? <laughs> the so, Sahara Desert. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> Which has a hundred times more water. Which is traditionally not the most aquatic of places. It's not. But now that we know this water is there, it can be utilised. We can use this in future missions. We can't use it in the next mission because we don't know how to best extract it yet. But the fact that we know it's there, we know what we need to potentially get it. So it's like going on a holiday and instead of having to take all of your water with you, you know the water's already there. But when you get there, you suddenly realise, oh no, it's all in glass bottles. I left the bottle opener at home. Well, as long as you just have to pack that bottle opener, you could get to the water. What might happen is that they start opening the water and go, oh no, it's sparkling water. <laughs> so we're not quite sure of finesse of this, of the water molecules yet, but it is certainly a step in the right direction. Yeah, it's going to be soily. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's hardly going to be like Buxton spring water, nice and chilled. Yeah. Oh, is there going to be like a moon spring? That would be good. First astronaut up there gets to create moon spring. It'll be right next to the Sierra Nevada microbrewery. Oh, from last month. Yes. So uh, there's water on the moon, but you could just take water up. What's, what's the benefit from having it on the moon already as opposed to just taking a bottle of water up with you? Well, we've actually spoken about this before with the Tsiolkovsky rocket equation, <laughs> if you remember. Uh -oh. But yeah, for new <laughs> listeners, my, my, my job on the show is to uh, ask the everyman questions. And uh, uh, for the purpose of the podcast, I'm going to have no idea what the uh, Sylvester <laughs> Stallone rocket equation is. But genuinely, I do know it off by heart. Who doesn't? But, uh, yeah. so, so what is the Sylvester Stall Stallone rocket equation? Tsiolkovsky rocket equation. It basically equates to you need this much fuel to get up this much weight to this much distance. So roughly, you're looking at between $3,000 and $10,000 per kilogram to get 
something into space, let alone to the moon, it's going to cost even more for that. You want to make sure utilize your storage and your weight to the bare bare essentials and water is heavy so you don't want to take up all that space all that weight with water when water could be on the moon so that's one less thing to carry which saves on weight which saves on fuel as well and if we're going to do mars exploration it'd be good to tap into the water that's on the moon that was it yes so you're saying the moon will become a, uh, a sort of filling station like a watering hole for the, uh, the the trips to the moon. Yeah, exactly. Because this um, was a big announcement from NASA. I kind of get the feeling that it was because they now realise that they're going to save a lot of money, <laughs> to be honest. Because I, I thought, oh, more water on the moon. Yeah, we already know. But it sounds as though it's, they're just going to save a lot of money. But it was so big, it hit Radio 1, I see, again, Andy. <laughs> or should I say, Sean Moondes. Uh Yes. Because of this uh, big announcement, which I think was off the back of that Life on Venus announcement, if you remember that, and when the Royal Astronomical Society did this, everyone was talking about it, and NASA thought, oh, hello, let's, uh, let's, let's test the waters with a little bit of a press release and a bit of a teaser. So they put out this big moon discovery thing, and that started making the rounds, and thankfully I was still flavour of the month then, and I think Greg James was like, oh, okay, some more moon news, we'll get Sean Moondes back on, so I managed to go back on Radio 1 and talk about water on the moon, which is quite nice. No, it's very good, and I'd like to say hello again to any listeners who managed to find this podcast, because I, I think, once again, you didn't plug the podcast. They said, don't plug it unless it comes up organically, and a chance didn't come up for me to go, well, I'll be talking more about this on my <laughs> moon podcast, because... <laughs> It's got to come up casually in conversation. It's like when, when you're desperate to brag about something, but you just want to get that opportunity because otherwise it looks like you're shoehorning in a topic into conversation for no reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is annoying when you're sort of crowbarring something in that's completely unrelated. As I was telling the Secretary General of the United Nations the other day <laughs> when he was at my house. <laughs> nice. So, in summary, there is water on the moon, more water than we thought before, but we still need to figure out how to extract it, which leads nicely into the next story, which is... A UK firm has figured out how to extract oxygen from moon rock. Way. Way, indeed. A Go Britain. <laughs> Yeah, this company is called Metallisys, and they're based in Sheffield. Uh, they've actually won a contract from ESA, the European Space Agency, to develop the technology to turn moon rocks and moon dust into oxygen. And when I say turn, it's extracting the oxygen that's already in that moon rock and separating out the oxygen and leaving behind useful elements as well, such as aluminium, iron, and other metal powders. I think there'll even be some gold and platinum in there, which is pretty cool. Before now, oxygen was kind of like seen as an impurity, whereas, oh, actually, if we can extract the pure oxygen from this moon rock, we can get the oxygen, combine it with hydrogen to make water, and also to use in rocket fuel as well, which is very, very useful. And breathing. Well, yeah, that, that would be nice too, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, just, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure. <laughs> pretty sure it's for breathing. Yeah, oxygen is for breathing. Actually, no, correct me if I'm wrong, and listeners of the show, if I'm wrong on this, tweet me or uh, leave a comment on this video if I am wrong. But I'm pretty sure <laughs> humans can't breathe in pure oxygen. I think it'll kill you. I think you need, like, nitrogen and a little bit of... Uh, other elements like inert gases like argon. I think pure oxygen kills you. Too much of a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so your lungs are like hedonistic people. You're like, oh, all this oxygen. Delightful. <laughs> One for Google or, yeah, leave it to the listeners. Yeah. Uh, I, know, I know you can get water poisoning if you drink too much water. Really? Yeah. And there's a sort of tribe in Indonesia or something that has water drinking contests and every so often someone dies from it. And it's just like, well, stop having those contests oh yeah exactly <laughs> have you heard of the um the sauna contests in finland no people sauna themselves to death wow <laughs> yeah don't look up the pictures because they're gruesome but right. <laughs> they, they have sauna contests and people sit in the saunas for as long as possible at as high a temperature as possible wow i don't know why to prove how finished they are but it's a uh, it's a competition it, it's competitions for anything isn't it like there's a there's a, a welsh competition or a welsh sport i believe called p 
purring, which is shin kicking. You fill your trousers full of hay, put on steel toe cap boots, grab each other by the shoulders. So two men grabbing each other by the shoulders and then you just start kicking each other in the shins. And the first person to let go of the shoulders loses. Yeah, that's because uh, we're based in the Cotswolds. That's a Cotswold Olympic game, I think. Oh, is I'm, it? I'm always tempted. To get, yeah, there's like a Cotswold Olympics. Obviously not at the moment because it's COVID. But yeah, I was looking at some of the games like uh, Dwyle flonking. That was a... <laughs> That sounds like the opening act for the Wurzels. Yeah, that's it. it. It might as well be. What the hell is that? Blindfolded Morris Dancer has a bucket of ale and dances around it with a mop type thing and then people dance around him. Then the music stops, at which point he flings the mop over his shoulder, but the mop isn't actually attached the mop head isn't attached to the stick. So it then flings off and if it hits anyone in the face they have to drink and they're out of the circle. And then it circle closes up, the mop head's replaced back in the bucket, and then they carry on uh, until <laughs> no one's left. Either in the wild flonking circle of dance, or just in general the audience have gone, because it's all very weird. Right. The Olympics is about pushing the boundaries of human athleticism. So the fact that they have the nerve to put this drinking game mixed with physical assault into something that has Olympics affixed to it is a travesty. I'll just check if they're using... Uh, yeah, they are. They're using Olympic in, in the title. So, yeah. Guess I don't know how you train for that event <laughs> either. <laughs> I don't know if anyone in that event has any skill whatsoever. <laughs> uh, do they have to do drug tests afterwards? Like, oh, oh he's been, he's been practising with non-alcoholic beer... That's it. He's been not doping. He's been noping. Just so you know, I've quickly looked it up. Cotswold Olympic Games. Events have included tug of war, gym carna, shin kicking, dwile flonking, motorcycle scrambling, judo, piano smashing and Morris dancing. Piano smashing. There's no sport to that. You're just smashing a piano. I can do that. Well, prove it. Enter the next Cotswold Olympic Games and we will see how good a piano smasher you are. Very well. Um, so, have you ever played Street Fighter 2? <laughs> <laughs> I desperately tried to get it back on track. I desperately tried. <laughs> no, no, I haven't played Street Fighter 2. Sorry, you haven't? No, no. Never? I... I'm aware of it. Like, I know it through cultural osmosis and I've seen other people play it, but I've never played Street Fighter 2. Or... Oh, right, because it was a seminal game, obviously a fighting game, but every few rounds you got a just smash this thing up round, like a car or a barrel in a barrel factory or something like that. So may maybe the, you, one of the levels is uh, piano. Okay, maybe, maybe. Maybe that's the, like, Street Fighter's Got Talent level. So I'm desperately trying to get back to this story, but I realise I think we've said absolutely everything there is to say about it, other than the actual numbers, which is Moon Rock is made of about 45% oxygen, and Issa has awarded a contract to Metallicis to basically figure out how to do this more efficiently. But other than here's some money, make it better. I don't think there's much else to report on this other than it's a great idea. They've got nine months to do it and I hope that they manage to perfect the electrochemical process that takes the oxygen from the moon rock. So do, do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, I did notice that uh, they're based in Sheffield, which, as we know from the Full Monty, uh, was a sort of industrial town where they did a lot of smelting metalwork. So uh, I don't know if you've seen the Full Monty, but at the beginning, the opening sequence is about Sheffield and the industrial brilliance it is. And then it's sort of, in the, that's a 1960s sort of film. And then it got, cuts to like 1980s, 1990s when it's all recession. Yeah. Uh, so that's how, that's how it opens. So I'm just imagining like a, they're going to just get half of Sheffield up on the moon and set up a, <laughs> set up a metal works <laughs> and, then, and then have bankruptcy when the, the business doesn't quite work because there's not enough customers and they all have to just turn to strippers. Turns out the clangers aren't paying as much for <laughs> <laughs> the steel as we wanted them to. Hopefully. But they will pay for us to take our clothes off. <laughs> So that's all the moon news I want to want to chat about. We're going to do some foreign moon news now. And if you're new to the show, this is when we talk about non-Earth moons. And this is an article that you sent to me, Rick, which is scientists claim the Earth satellite may have a dead ringer. And I hate this article. It was one of the most annoying things to read. And it's from The Guardian, 
which can be annoying in a different sense, but this was like it was written at a bus stop. <laughs> it was all just, just like, oh, so what does this mean? It means this. Oh, how did they discover it? Oh, they discovered it via this, rather than just like a nice journalistic flow that you're used to. So I, I appreciate they're trying something new, but it was just frustrating because I then had to go to other sources to get the idea of what they were actually trying to say, which is a bit of rock that's a Mars Trojan, basically an asteroid that's in the same orbital plane as Mars, is made up of the same material as the moon is, to an uncanny point where it could be a bit of moon that was blasted off during an impact and managed to make its way all the way out to the Martian orbit. That's the story. Oh, okay, thank you for summarising. I didn't get that because I sent it to you saying, isn't this already the case or something like that? Because I'm sure I've seen QI or like a few years, someone says, oh, we've got a second moon or something like that. Yeah, we talked about this last episode. That second mini moon is going to be in Earth's orbit in the next couple of days and then it's going to leave early next year. Oh yeah, not that one. Uh, we, oh, we've got a second moon, but it's way off in the distance and we very rarely see it or stuff like that. Yeah, reading it now or having it explained to me, it's like, okay, no, it's not going around Earth, it's going around Mars. Yeah, exactly. And it's a Mars Trojan, which you know means... Well, I don't know it means anything, because uh, I'm every man. Okay. A Mars Trojan means it is trailing behind Mars 60 degrees. So imagine Mars going around the sun, you've got 360 degrees. That's the full orbit, 60 degrees behind Mars, so less than a quarter of the way around the sun. You've got this little asteroid, which is delightfully called 1998 VF31, and then it's got another string of numbers after it. So it's sat 60 degrees behind Mars in a stable point in its orbit known as a Lagrangian point. And it's a stable point because the gravitational pull of Mars and the gravitational pull of the Sun kind of cancel each other out and just leave this little stable point in the orbit. And there's another one 60 degrees in front of Mars. And there's another two little points which are where the moons of Mars lie. So those are like stable points in the orbit. And there'll be a link to Lagrangian points in the show notes. And here is the typical Lagrangian point point diagram for what is a Trojan moon or what is a Trojan asteroid. Ta-da! That's fantastic. This is like the third episode in a row. I think you've had to explain Lagrangian points after a drought of, <laughs> I don't know, about 10 episodes where you got by without having to do it. A Lagrangian drought. If you're listening to this and this is the first time you've come across a Lagrangian point, uh, change the word Lagrangian for magical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that makes more sense. And also go and have a look at a diagram because there's no way you can explain it without one. Oh, th thanks, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes a hell of a lot more sense. You go, oh, right, magic points. So how do they know it's the same type of stuff as the moon? The non sciencey answer is it's roughly the same colour as the moon. <laughs> that, that's a bit weak. That, that is a bit weak. So let me put it in the sciencey term, which is... Sorry, just to put out how weak that is, my notebook next to me is the same colour as the moon. <sighs> I'm pretty sure that my notebook didn't come from a, an impact thousands of years ago. Well, what you can do on it is, <laughs> <laughs> is something called a spectroscopic observation, which is looking at how the light is reflecting off your notebook and how the light is reflecting off this Trojan asteroid that's going around Mars. And you look at how the light is reflecting and that will tell you what material it's made of. And that's based on the angle it's reflecting, the elements that have been absorbed by the material, the elements that are reflected stronger than others. So it just tells you what it's made of by looking at how the light is reflected. And that's called spectroscopic observations. And that's what they did on this asteroid. Is that like the equivalent of when you've got what looks like a clean glass, but you hold it up and you go, oh, hang on, in this light, it's got really dank brown stains on it for some reason. I don't I don't want to drink out of it. Well, you look at it from different angles and different lights and you suddenly start seeing things. Yes, but the angle doesn't matter at this point because it's on like a molecular level. The angle of what, how you look at it doesn't matter. But yeah, that's a good example of, oh, under this light, it looks grimy. Well, before we move on to the next story, which actually talks about light and how things are reflected, I'll quickly sum up. The moon might have a so-called dead ringer orbiting Mars. It could be a chunk of the moon that was blasted off in an impact, because if you look at the moon, it's covered in craters, so there has been a lot of impacts. And this asteroid that's less than a kilometre wide could well be a chunk of the moon based on these observations that tell you what it's made of. And it seems to be made of the same stuff as the moon. So... 
carrying on with foreign moon news and we're going to Jupiter now where Jupiter's moon Europa has ice that could be glowing in the dark. Ooh, that sounds exciting. Yeah. I like the um, sort of caveat, could, so that implies it might not. Well, yes, it's based on lab experiments because obviously there's no humans on Europa. There's no probes on Europa. The closest one we have is the Juno missions, which we talked about last episode, where Juno's getting closer to Europa, but there's nothing actually on the surface. So what scientists at NASA, JPL, which stands for the Jet Propulsion Lab, have been doing is they've been simulating the conditions on Europa and simulating the ice and bombarding it with the same high energy electrons that will be coming from Jupiter's magnetic field. So they've got this ice, that's structured in the same way that it would be on Europa, bombarding it with the same amount of high energy electrons. And they found that in certain conditions, this light actually starts to glow. When the electrons, these high energy electrons, hit the molecules in the ice, the water molecules, the molecules fall apart and they're broken apart because of this high energy and they're broken up into their constituent atoms. So if you have like water, it's broken down into H and O. So these atoms will absorb the energy and then the energy is re-emitted as light and as it's re-emitted because of the conditions because of the way it was put together and because of the certain amount of energy that was put in they're re-emitted as this green glowing light almost and the cool thing is because ice isn't pure water in this case it'll be mixed up with other things like there'll be a bit of carbon in there there'll be a bit of methane there'll be all sorts of things in there depending on the type of molecule that absorbed the energy and then re-emitted it as light it'll glow at different levels so sodium chloride salt causes the glow to decrease a little bit whereas other atoms i think water for example would, when broken down it would glow a bit brighter that's amazing that that does sound really good so I'm imagining if I go on Europa and start wandering around and touching things, does it start all lighting up like, you know, Avatar, when they go around oh, touching yeah. all the plants, except it's more green. Avatar was very blue. Uh, Avatar uh, was so, very blue, yes. <laughs> yeah. So Europa's going to be very green. It would be green and it would glow greenish, but I don't think glowing as much as the northern lights. Also, this is assuming that you wouldn't die. Because the high energy particles uh, coming from Jupiter's powerful magnetic field and high energy particles are radiation. That's what radiation is. Charged particles that interact with the molecules and the cells and all of your atoms in your body. And because they're charged, they're going to interact with them and damage them. And that's what radiation sickness and radiation poisoning is. It's charged particles interacting with your body and messing it up. Well, I don't necessarily mind that if it's like a low level like an x-ray or something, because, you know, that's I want my pretty light show. So how much radiation would I get on Europa? Okay, well, how much radiation do you think you get in a year? <laughs> um, I don't know. Well, what do we measure radiations in? Chernobyls? <laughs> no. There's a whole range of different measurements, but the common one tends to be sieverts. And the annual yearly dose for a human is roughly about two sieverts. Now, if you're in Cornwall or around that part of the country where there's a lot of radon, then it goes a bit higher to about four, which is not good. So you have like annual doses and you're not supposed to exceed them. So are Cornish people getting radiation poisoning or is there sort of, uh, you can have up to five or something? Well, no, actually, they are getting sicker on a greater rate. You get a radon map of the UK of where the levels of radon are higher than others. And then you get like a map of cancer patients and like cancer rates in the UK and they perfectly correlate so it's quite scary and Cornwall and actually where I grew up in North Wales has a fair bit of radon and cancer rates are quite high around there because of this radon because it's higher sorry the background radiation is actually higher than the annual dose that you're allowed to get which is about two and a bit sieverts on Europa you get 5.4 sieverts a day. <laughs> so, that's a, sorry, you were saying it was two per year. Two, so. two per year is what you're allowed, whereas on okay. Europa, it's five and a half per day. Right, so five, what, five and a half times... Uh, Rick, I was wrong. The annual radiation dose in the UK that you get from background radiation, it is 2.7 sieverts, but it's 2.7 milli sieverts, so a thousand times less. Than what I okay. said. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, that's, I'll, I'll put the uranium rod away. I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> I, can, I can heat my bath without putting on the gas this evening. 
Yeah, so uh, it's been a while since I've studied this, hence why I was uh, a little... <laughs> yeah, whoops, sorry about that. 2.4 millisieverts is what humans are allowed per year, but a lethal dose is 4.3 sieverts over five hours. That's what a lethal dose of radiation is. So that much radiation will kill you. So if you're getting 5.4 sieverts per day on Europa, then you'll be dead within a day or two. Okay, probably not worth going to look at the light show. Uh, no, just look at it from the Juno photos. So stay well away from uh, Europa, even though it's a pretty light display. Yeah, there you go. That's in a nutshell. Treat it like Blackpool. Sticking with Jupiter, we are now going to talk about the lost moons of Jupiter, because two have been recovered. Uh, I'd like to thank N3 for bringing these to my attention. I think he's updated the Wikipedia article for them already and put some more context to the press releases, so thank you very much for that, N3. N N3, is that a, an institution or a username? Oh yeah, sorry, that, that's, I think, his online handle. He's on Twitter and he updates a lot of the images for moons on Wikipedia, so they're all public domain, and he's he's doing bloody good work. He is. So he's an institution. Uh, yes, uh, private private enthusiast. I I find him invaluable at the moment because I'm going to be using I think his images of Tarvos, a moon of Saturn. That's going to be one of the next videos I'll be making because that's a nice small moon, and I want to do small moon videos soon. Anyways, speaking of small moons, the Two moons of Jupiter were considered lost, but have been recovered. They are lovingly called S2003J9 and S2003J16. Bingo. Ah, yes. <laughs> um, uh, we can all stop looking for them. Yes. Um, where were they lost? Uh, they were lost around Jupiter. <laughs> you are, yeah, fair. yeah where, where did you last have them? What, these Jupiter moons? Oh, we had them around Jupiter, Garth. <laughs> oh, where did you find them? Oh, around Jupiter again. Well, they are. Around Jupiter. <laughs> so the reason why they, they were lost is because when they're discovered, you'll have, like, several images. You'll spot a moon against the backdrop of stars, and it'll be following a certain path. And you go, right, that path is roughly at this angle, and it's... This eccentricity, this inclination, there'll be lots of really complicated orbital math thrown at it. And they'll be able to go, right, it has been observed at this part of the sky. We reckon it's going to be at this part of the sky, given these orbital parameters at this date. So then they'll do follow-up observations to confirm that, okay, is the moon where they said it was going to be? If so, great, we've found it. It's confirmed. Is it there? Oh, no, it's lost. So these moons were discovered, but then considered lost because they couldn't be seen in follow-up observations. But it turns out they were lost in 2003, and they've been spotted many, many times in photos taken across the last decade, and they've only been announced recently, probably because, as you mentioned in other episodes, there's a backlog of images and there's probably more important things to process. But in the downtime between the bigger projects, you can look at these old images, and that's what's happened. So there were some images taken in 2010, some in 2018, and they've been recovered from these images. Well, is this the equivalent of when Elvis died? People kept sort of spotting him in the background of various images, burritos and stuff. No, because Elvis is dead. <laughs> oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> uh... If he's dead, why, why is he in my taco? Okay, uh, I'm going to borrow a quote from 30 Rock here, which is, it's like trying to find... Wally or Waldo, but the image you're looking at, it's like a barber pole factory. <laughs> right. and it's just it's just a sea of red and white. He could be anywhere. But they've finally gone through the images and gone, there, there he is. Like in all of this haze, we've managed to find the moon. So S2003 J16 and S2003 J9 have been rediscovered again. Do you know who originally discovered them? Um no. Oh, come on, take a wild stab in the dark. Right. Is it your favourite moon hunter, Scott Shepard? Scott S. Shepard, notorious moon spotter. Okay, and who rediscovered them? Ah, uh, good question. I think Scott Shepard rediscovered S2003J9, but S2003J16 was recovered by Christian Vellet, or Velit, probably butchering his last name, but it'll be a whole team of astronomers who work on these images and the follow-up images. If you look at the actual notes, or the minor planet sensors circulars, or these announcements, you have a look at the names involved, and it's it's the same names that keep popping up. So you've got, like, Scott Shepard, 
Brett Gladman, JJ Calabas. Well, they're familiar to me because I look at all of this kind of like discovery data all the time and look at who discovered what moons. It does sound like you're reading out members of a 1970s band that you remember. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest, those names mean nothing to me. But although I would say to the listeners, if you keep listening, you will gradually hear Andy mention these names a lot. Yeah, it's like when you get into any niche field, the same names keep cropping up time and time again. I just like the idea of Scott Shepard, who, who discovers all these moons, has discovered a moon, then lost it, and then rediscovered it. It just reminds me of this sort of magician doing the disappearing, reappearing ball or coin trick. He goes, oh, I've got a coin. Oh, it's behind me. Yeah. Where is it? Oh, the hands are... Oh, no, it's up your nose. And <laughs> Scott Shepard sort of go there. Oh, well, I've found a moon while Jupiter, but now it's gone. Where is it? Oh, I've discovered it again. Oh, no, it was there all the time in the photos, in the background, but you didn't see. Oh, wait, where, uh, nothing in my sleeves, nothing in my sleeves. There we go. There it's back again. Uh, I personally don't see it like that, but if that's how you interpret it, go, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure, yeah. I mean, he's Scott Shepard. He can yeah, stick a whole moon in his sleeve and you'd never know. So, in summary, two moons of Jupiter were lost, but now they've been found. Hooray. Do you know what time it is, Rick? Um, moon time? I don't know. What, moon of the month? It's time for full moon of the month. <laughs> moon time doesn't help because it's all <laughs> moons. <laughs> So, this is the part of the show where we talk about the names of the full moon of the month, and this moon is going to be called the Frost Moon, which makes sense because it's November. And in the UK, the full moon will be on the 30th of November, so it'll be really into winter then, hence Frost Moon works wonderfully. There are some other great names as well. There's Freezing Moon, Dark Depths Moon, which is a great one. And then it goes to animal-relating ones, such as the whitefish moon, the digging-slash-scratching moon, the deer-rotting moon, as in rotting the ground, I don't know. Rotting antlers, isn't it? When they um, hit antlers together, prove who's the dominant one, isn't it? Yes, it is. I just googled it. Okay, so deer-rotting moon, so when deers are bashing their heads together, and the beaver moon. I don't know why it's called the beaver moon. I would have thought they would be hibernating. That's probably why. It's always named after an animal doing a thing this month that they don't normally do. Oh, it's because beavers are particularly active this time of year because they're building winter dams in preparation for the cold season. There you go. Told you. They're building dams. Beavers are mainly nocturnal, so they keep working under the light of the full moon. That actually makes sense. Yeah, for once. <laughs> unlike, unlike many of the names. <laughs> Uh, so, continuing with our Sioux and Tribe full moon names, which we've had Hard Time, Long Day, Sore Eye, which was waking up with a hangover, then the hangover remedy of Frog, Idle, Full Leaf, and then walking off the hangover in the afternoon with Red Berries, Black Cherries, and Yellow Leaves. And then last month, we had the great one of Gopher Looks Back, and this is when the remorse of the night before sinks in, and oh god, what did I do when the Gopher Looks Back moon... And this moon, in this law as well, called the Frost Moon. So I'm going to put this of the frosty stares from the acquaintances that you slagged off while drunk the night before. <laughs> okay, we'll write to the Suan tribes and see if they can update their law. Yes, yeah, I will do, or at least add more context to it. But out of those names, do you have a particular favourite? Uh, I like the Frost Moon, actually, uh, as it is, because it reminds me of Warcraft 3, where they had a sword called Frost Morn. I was like, because <laughs> when I got the show notes, I was like, oh, what? Frost Moon, that sounds really familiar. Fro where have I heard that before? And it was in Warcraft 3, where they kept going on about Frost Morn. Warcraft 3 is in a computer game. Yes. World of Warcraft 3. No, no. Oh, flipping heck. You don't know Street Fighter 2. and the, the... Well, no, Warcraft originally was a, a oh. real-time strategy game. Yes, I know of this game. Again, I didn't play it. I played um, Man and Conquer, Red Alert 2, and Age of Empires instead of this one. Okay. But I am aware of this game, and I like my mates used to play this one, and I remember going, hey, mum, can, can I get this? We just bought you Roller Coaster Tycoon. Go play that. So I got really good at Roller Coaster Tycoon, and my friends... <laughs> all got stronger friendships while they bonded over World of Warcraft 3. <laughs> but I managed to perfect my park and how to make a roller coaster without making people want to be sick afterwards. So I really perfected that one. That's good. <laughs> set, set you up well. You've got no friends, but you do run that theme park. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, tangent. Was Roller Coaster Tycoon, that's definitely different to Theme Park? Yeah, they came out at the same time. There was like an era in the late 90s and early 2000s when there were just constant copycats of everything. For example, Bugs Life came out and then DreamWorks had to go and make Ants at the same time. There was Deep Impact and Armageddon came out at the same time. So then you had Theme Park World and Roller Coaster Tycoon, they came out. And then you had all these tycoons that kind of exploded. You had The Sims, but then Theme Hospital, Sim City, all of this kind of stuff. Just these two rival studios just releasing copycat games. Yeah, I, I played Theme Park and originally I played it properly. And then once you get into the simulations, you learn how to game them. On Theme Park, all you had to do was build a one-way system around your whole park where they passed all the shops to get to the ride. Then it didn't matter if they went on the ride or not. They ended up at the same path, which was one way, and they had to do all the shops again <laughs> to go on to the next ride. Um, and the shops were in a certain order. I think it was you had to put your fries stool first, so they had salt. Yeah. And that made them thirsty, and so they got drink. And But basically, if they were only just forced to go one way around your park and have to do all the shops in order to get to any ride they wanted to do, uh, you just made millions. Yeah, exactly. I did something similar in Roller Coaster Tycoon where I made lemonade free but charged a quid for toilets. And <laughs> the other one was... I always jacked up the price of umbrellas to like 20 quid. They were meant to be like four quid in the game. So I just racked them up to 20 quid. So any time it rained, I just got a couple of grand. It was, <laughs> it was brilliant. So you could game the system that way. They fixed it in subsequent releases, but it was more fun when you could figure out how to do this without cheats. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so Frost Moon is your favorite moon name. I'm quite fond of Beaver Moon, but I also like Darkest Depths Moon as well. And so we now come on to the next bit of the show, which is And The Next Moon Is, which this time it's Themisto. So this is when we're entering the phase where the moons are going to get a lot, lot smaller and they're going to turn into space rocks rather than fully fledged planets. There's not going to be anything like a volcano moon and an ice moon for a little bit. But each one of these moons is interesting and has something to offer. And Themisto is quite an interesting moon because all the other moons that we're going to talk about for quite a while are all grouped together. So you've got the Kame group, the Ananke group, the Pasiphae group. Whereas this one, Themisto, is not part of any group. It's like a lone wolf almost. So Themisto, to give you the basics, Themisto is the ninth moon out from Jupiter. It orbits at seven and a bit million kilometers from Jupiter. That's five and a half million times further out than Callisto, so it's a significant jump in moons now. Themisto was discovered in 1975 using photographic plates, but it wasn't confirmed, so it wasn't necessarily considered lost, it was just first spotted but not followed up until 25 years later in 2000 when they did observations of, and they spotted a moon and then went, oh hang on, that trajectory seems familiar, and it turns out they'd rediscovered Themisto. So the photos that are on Wikipedia and the photos when you Google for Themisto are the ones taken in 2000. The, the photos taken in 1975 were actually on photographic plates. And I've emailed the observatory trying to get hold of them for this show, but I haven't heard back from them yet. What I'm hoping to do is obviously make a video about this, so I will include the plates if I manage to get hold of them. I'll keep nudging them every now and then. So Themisto is quite unique as well because you've got all of the other moons we've talked about of Jupiter have been orbiting on the equatorial plane which means they orbit pretty much in the same direction as Jupiter with an inclination of roughly zero. So they all orbit on the same plane. Imagine Saturn with its rings and the direction the particles and the rings are going around Saturn. Those are all on the equatorial plane, the equator. So that's how all the moons we've talked about so far have been orbiting around Jupiter. This one orbits at an angle 43 degrees to the equator of Jupiter. So it has an inclination of 43 degrees, which is pretty big. Um, why does it do that? Well, it could well be a captured moon because it's orbiting at 43 degrees and it has like it's not a perfectly circular orbit. It has an eccentricity of 0.2, which means it's quite an oval orbit. So an oval orbit, a weird angle 
it's quite far away from the planet, these are all hallmarks of irregular moons, which quite often mean they were either captured or the fragments of a earlier moon. Now, considering the Misto is not part of an orbital group, chances are it's in fact a captured moon. So what is a captured moon? A captured moon is an asteroid that was flying by the planet, but the gravitational pull of the planet was so strong and the asteroid or the moon or the now captured moon was going past the planet so close that it got caught in the gravity of the planet and it was orbiting the planet for long enough, like doing loops around it, oval loops, for enough energy to be lost from that original trajectory and get captured in a stable orbit around the planet. So you know what Earth is getting a second moon in a bit. We talked about that on last show and it's just going to be a random bit of space debris. In this case it could actually be man-made space debris, but it's a random bit of space debris that's flying past Earth and it's going to get caught in the orbit, do a loop or two, but in that time, not enough energy is going to be lost and it's going to escape Earth's orbit and go off on a new trajectory. With the Misto, it got caught in Jupiter's orbit and went around the planet so many times that it got trapped in the orbit. Enough energy was lost, so it then fell into a stable orbit around the planet. So who discovered it? Originally, it was discovered by Charles T. Colwell and Elizabeth Romer, and that was uh, back in 1975. And then it was rediscovered by... Is it Scott Shepard? Right, okay. It's yeah. Scott I Shepard. Would, 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 <laughs> wouldn't be. Yeah, this is, uh, and this is what I was talking about with the familiar name. So Scott Shepard rediscovered it in 2000, along with David C. Jewett, which is a name that keeps cropping up. And then other observations were made by Brett Gladman, J.J. Cavaliers, Hans Scholl, Matthew Holman, Brian Marsden, all the big hitters. Oh, and Jean-Marc Petit as well. Like, loads of people were involved, and it'll be like different teams on different telescopes scattered across the world, and they did all the confirmation images of finding this moon again. So originally it was two people in 1975, and then it was a whole plethora of people in the 2000s that rediscovered this moon. The two things that are probably worth mentioning are the name, of course, which is always an interesting bit. The rules are, if it's a moon of Jupiter, it has to be named after a lover and, and in some cases, or descendant of Jupiter, or Zeus. And in this case, the Misto is the daughter of the river god Enchius. Incus, daughter of the river god and lover of Zeus in Greek mythology. So that's Themisto. She was someone's daughter. It's always someone's daughter. Is there a, um, a funky close-up picture of it? Not close-up. It's always of a distance. I've included one of the show notes and there'll be an animation on Wikipedia, which I'll put on the YouTube video now. One of the other things that's probably worth mentioning of, which is what N3 has put together some notes for me, which is very, very sweet of him to do. Um, he's gone above and beyond for this. Does Themisto fall into the orbital resonance of the Galilean moons. So you know Io, Europa and Ganymede all have this orbital resonance where for every one orbit someone will do two and an another one will do four. And there's this like grouping of them. Is there an orbital resonance for Themisto even though it's 5.5 million kilometres further out than Callisto? Which by the way, Callisto is not part of this resonance. Only the other three Galilean moons are. Callisto isn't. So I thought, eh, it probably isn't, because the Misto is so far out. And if Callisto, being that close to the other moons, is not part of the resonance, then there's no chance for the Misto. Turns out, though, it might well fall into an orbital resonance of something called the Lidov Kozai resonance. Um, I'm guessing you don't know what that is. <laughs> would you believe? No idea. Um, <laughs> I'll just check my notes. No, I've, I've got a list of everything I've ever learned in my life. And uh, no, the Lisi Kozai residence, resonance, or residence, both of them, I've never, never uh, learned. Okay, so lead of Kozai mechanism, or resonance sometimes. Sorry, is it lead of? As in, I've got the lead of a dog in my hand or something. No, it, it's, it's surnames of scientists. So Kozai, K-O-Z-A-I, and Lidov, L-I-D-O-V. Kozai, Lidov, Lidov, Kozai mechanism. What this is, is you have a moon and a planet. And in this case, the Misto has a high inclination and a weird eccentricity. So its orbit is inclined and oval. And that moon is going around the planet. And what the Lidov, Kozai mechanism introduces is a massive third body that's very far away from this system. So you have planet, moon, system on one hand, and then extend your arms. And on the other hand, you have this massive, massive body that's really heavy and far away, but still has a gravitational effect on the moon around the planet, even though it's so far away. 
and this mechanism finds a link between the eccentricity and the inclination. So the moon is going around the planet and at one point it'll become less inclined but more oval and then it'll become more inclined but then less oval and it's like this this swaying this uh, this link between inclination and eccentricity that is caused by this massive massive object so it's pulling the moon out of its orbit but it's getting snapped back in by the planet and loads of moons do this and they're all smaller regular moons mostly of the gas giants uh, one of the other moons that i was looking at called seo is uh, falls victim to the lead of cozy mechanism and this has got some maths and some numbers to back it up as well. In the example that I gave, the massive third body, that was the sun that affects the moons going around the planet. What's happening here is because Themisto is so small and Callisto and Ganymede are so big, like they are trying to just quickly pull the numbers out of my head. They're about a billion times heavier than Themisto. It's actually another moon that's inducing this lead of Kozai mechanism, where normally it's a star. In this case, it's another close by big moon. That's amazing. That, <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Once again, I was like, I, I think a diagram might work because I'm perplexed. Kind of get it's another sort of there's magic points in space or magic effects in space when you get some things interacting and gravity happens to be stronger here and weaker there and look at this it forms a pattern yeah pretty much that you hit the nail on the head in this case not points but effects so without the moons themisto would just happily go around jupiter in its nice oval orbit but because you have these massive massive moons that are fairly close by even though it's millions of kilometers away callisto and also ganymede are pulling the Misto in and out of its oval orbit. So it has an average path, but it sways either side of it because of these moons. One of the moon videos I'm making at the moment is for a Saturnian moon called Pallini, and that sways either side of its orbit as well. That's due to the lead of Kozai mechanism, which is another interesting thing about these moons. So even though the Misto is just a space pebble, that's interesting enough because it's got its own unique orbit it's not part of a group it's got an additional knowledge nugget to it which is it's affected by the lead of Kozai mechanism induced by other moons not a massive star which i find is really interesting yeah that's impressive thing is though i didn't know the lead of Kozai mechanism existed uh so to find out that it exists for moons is like okay yeah fine i'll i'll, I'll believe anything now you know can you just add on <laughs> <laughs> Any bit of information, and I'll, I'll believe it. But yes, I can imagine if you've worked this out for big stars and so on, and then uh, someone says, oh, actually, this works for moons, because, you know, gravity doesn't discriminate, as long as the, the, the numbers are right. It yeah, exactly. I'd like to point out that this is news for me too. I thought it was just stars that did this. I didn't realise that it, it makes sense that it'd be other big moons that did this as well. But yeah, yeah, it's news to me too, basically. Cool. So that's Themisto. As as always, you like to give a nickname to the moon. What nickname are you going to give to Themisto? It's going to be the lonely something because it's on its own. Levi Kozai moon. Well, sorry, what was the thing? Co <laughs> well, what uh, uh, N3 put in the notes for the lead of Kozai resonance and mechanism that he explained, because Themisto is just within the boundaries that, yes, this could be part of the lead of Kozai resonance and lead of Kozai mechanism, it gets a kick from Ganymede and Callisto. So he's referred to it as a gravitational kick. Maybe the lonely kicking moon? Is it getting kicked or is it kicking? Uh, I suppose it's getting kicked by the big moons. All oh, right, the kicked lonely moon then. <laughs> There you go, Themisto is the kicked lonely moon. I already know what nickname you're going to give to the next moon, which is Leader, but we'll talk about that when it's Leader's time. Oh, right. I'm sorry, I'll make a note of predictable nickname. So next time, when I come back to it, I will try and be deliberately obscure. Oh, good. We're going to end the show on a brand new feature called Prime Moonister's Questions. Oh, damn! The, I remember this one, though, from the pilot show. Uh, and it was dropped pretty quickly. It was reliant on an audience, which we didn't have at the time. Yeah, so Prime Minister's Questions was people can ask you questions and you'll answer them in a Prime Minister's Question Time type manner so you don't know what's coming through the door sort of thing. That was the idea, but I, I like the name so much, I've kept it, and I've done my research for the question, which someone asked me on Twitter. Claire Crabtree tweeted, always wondered why we can't see the flag or flagpole from the moon landing, which is a fantastic question, and one that I asked myself, even in the midst of doing the physics degree. It's not an obvious answer, 
But when you start to look at the maths and when you start to look at the size of things involved... I assume there's a premise in the question that you're allowed instruments or, you know, scientific equipment to go and look at it. Because um, the, the simple answer is, well, the moon is bloody miles away, so you can't see it with the naked eye. But I assume with a telescope, like one of the big telescopes, you could have a fair crack at it. Yeah, I think Claire assumes that, okay, I've got a telescope. Uh, it's a pretty powerful one. Why can't I see yeah. the moon lander? I can look at craters in exquisite detail on the moon, and I know there's all these uh, gorgeous photos all over the internet of people taking these really zoomed in images with their telescopes in their back gardens. So why can't we see the moon lander? Well, the problem is it's just too small and the telescopes are not powerful enough. Like the moon lander from the Apollo 11 missions, in fact, all moon landers are roughly four meters across. And you're trying to look at an object that's four meters across, 384,000 kilometers away, 384 million meters away. That's the equivalent of trying to look at a coin in New York when you're in Miami, Florida. But with a telescope, Andy, telescopes are magical. They can, I can appreciate it with like naked eye. That's not going to work because you'll just get weirdos in Florida saying, what are you squinting at? Um, <laughs> yes. And... But with a telescope, okay, it needs to be a really, really powerful telescope. And the spy satellites that we have orbiting the Earth and they're looking down and they're able to look at like cars, for example, in really, really clear detail. Like you could be able to make out the shape and color of a car from a spy satellite. Well, that's still less than 500 kilometers up. Like low Earth orbit is 500 kilometers up. So it, it's still less than a thousand miles. So how many low Earth orbits are there between Earth and the moon? 700. Okay, so the best telescopes we have can make out a car. Well, let's think about this. The best telescope we have in space is the Hubble telescope. So why can't we use that to look at the moon lander? The problem is its resolution is pants for looking at tiny objects that are far away. So you know that famous image that the Hubble telescope took, the pillars of creation from the Eagle Nebula, those like big dusty stacks? Yes, yeah, I mean, that's, that's quite a big object. I assume that's more than four metres across. Well, that object is 7,000 light years away. Yeah. So 7,000 light years away, but those objects are five light years in height. So that's the difference of 7,000 over five, whereas the flagpole that you're trying to find on the moon is two meters high, but it's 384 million meters away. So seven over five, you could kind of get that resolution, but 384 million over two, that's a massive discrepancy. And it's just outside of the bounds of being able to view with the Hubble telescope. That said, the lunar lander has been photographed by a satellite called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So do you remember the big moon that toured the country and we went to go see it in the cathedral and you could go see it as an art installation project? Oh yes, the big model of the moon. Sorry, yeah, it's was, was like the big moon that toured the country. Is that how orbits work? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> It toured every yeah. country, Andy. Yeah, well, yeah, the main moon tours all the countries all the time. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyways, the way that that model was put together was using images taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter took photos of the lunar lander. And uh, Claire, if you're listening to this, I'll link you the photos that were part of a NASA press release. And you can see the difference because it took photos of the lunar lander at two different heights. One was taken at an altitude of... 31 miles, so 50 kilometers, and then it went further in and got one at 13 miles, so 21 kilometers, and you can see how the resolution improves, but not that much. You would have thought that like halving the distance would double the resolution, but unfortunately that's not how optics work. But you still can't see the flag. What you can see is the shadow. You can see the lunar lander. You can see the tracks from the moon buggies that went around it. You can even see a few little bits of astronaut footprints as they scuff up the tracks either side of it. So you can see disturbances. You can't see the flag because it's a bird's eye view of a flagpole. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, it, that's damn near impossible to see anyway. But what you, what you can see is the shadow of the flag and the flagpole. So that's still there. Uh, do you know what's cool though? That if you were able to look at the flag, it wouldn't be the American flag. It would just be pure white because the sun will have bleached it entirely. 
Yes, I, I think I remember you saying that from like a while back. Whether that was a pub conversation or a podcast, but yeah. Yeah, it'll be entirely bleached. Yeah, so the flag doesn't, the moon doesn't belong to America now. It's just surrendered. <laughs> so, what I like about the, um, the the images is the were the astronauts drunk? They're not going in straight lines to anywhere. Okay, you could be as sober as a parrot. You can be the soberest of sober people. And if you don't have any guides on the floor and you had a bird's eye view of just like this plain field with no fences, no edges, no markings, nothing, you wouldn't be able to walk in a straight line. Yeah, I think they were drunk. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> yeah, it does look like that from a bird's eye view, but those are also moon buggy paths and they were having to avoid craters because if the moon buggy got stuck in them, that's it. Yeah. No no one comes out to rescue them, like the AA or the RAC or whatever. Call, call out charge is a nightmare. Another thing that I wanted to point out, a little bit of maths actually, just to add a bit more science into it, other than, oh, it's just too far away or it's just too small to see. Imagine you have... Uh, a backyard telescope with a 10 centimeter disc or lens on it, which is a pretty standard lens, nice big chunky telescope. And you compare it to the like the huge ground-based telescopes like the Keck Observatory in Hawaii, which is a 10 meter lens. You can only see so much from the ground because the Earth's atmosphere introduces, it's called twinkling limits. And also the, the way that light is affected by the medium of the atmosphere and how the temperature changes will affect how the light goes through. Sorry, twinkling limits? Is that a proper thing? Because that sounds like the police pulling over a fairy or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stars twinkle because of atmospheric disturbances and if they're below a certain size in the sky you won't be able to see them because the atmosphere blurs them out okay so if i'm up in space on the hubble telescope looking out all the twinkly stars won't be twinkly they'll just be dots yeah exactly oh they lose their romance then uh no supernovas are pretty pretty romantic like all the colors and the swirls and the patterns anyways there is a limit to, to how much sky you can see so imagine the horizon is 180 degrees so you got your protractor half your protractor out 180 degrees is the entire sky and you look up and you've got one degree well that one degree can be split into something called arc minutes so one degree has 60 arc minutes and one arc minute has 60 arc seconds you following me? Uh, yes, you're using time to do angles. It works quite nicely, you know, 360 in a circle, 60 minutes, 60 seconds. So you've got degrees, 60 arc minutes to a degree, and 60 arc seconds to an arc minute. Looking up at the moon, and you're looking at the exact point where the flag for the, from the Apollo missions is, how much sky is that flag taking up? Um, it'll be a small fraction of an arc second, so I don't know, an arc arc millisecond. Yeah, it is 0 0.0021 arc seconds, so two thousandths of an arc second. That's how much sky the flag will take up, and because of the atmosphere, the best resolution you can get from a ground-based telescope is one arc second. Is that, like, from the best, the 10 metre... That doesn't matter. If you have a 10 centimetre telescope or a 10 metre telescope, you're limited to one arc second. Oh, right. OK. And and this, the flagpole is like, sorry, two thousandths or two hundredths? Yeah, it's 500 times smaller than an arc second. All oh, right. OK. You got no chance then. Yeah, exactly. And it's it, it's a case of it being too small and too far away. So that's the maths behind it and with a bit of hand wavy explanation. So Claire, if you're listening, hopefully that answered your question to however much you wanted to be answered it by. Okay, so the follow on question is what object do they need to put up there so that we can see it through a telescope? As in what's what's the smallest crater size? Yeah, no, nah, what, what's the biggest? So if they could go, take some tarpaulin or something. <laughs> How big does that have to be? Like? So like 500 times the size of a flagpole. So that's a thousand metres. Right. So, okay. So if they got out a kilometre bit of tarpaulin, kilometre squared, and put that out, pegged it down to keep it away from the wind that there isn't on the moon, um, <laughs> would we we'd be able to see that? If you put it in an area of the moon where it's pretty plain and there's not a lot of like change in the background so it's like pure white and plain and it's a very dark tarpaulin you might be able to say that pixel is dark whereas everyone else around it is white 
therefore that's the tarpaulin. So you might be able to see it, but you won't be able to like make out the corners or it covers several pixels. It will cover a pixel. Okay, so you need a few tarpaulins to spell out rude words and stuff. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. It's probably better to pay a skywriter to do it for you. So that's the answer to why you can't see the flagpole or even the Apollo lander on the moon from Earth. That was a great question, Claire. And if you guys have any other Prime Moonisters questions, please feel free to tweet me or leave a comment on this video and we'll go through the best, maybe even do a Twitter poll. I haven't decided how I'll do this yet. And we'll figure out what question we'll do in next episode's Prime Minister's questions, if we have one. I'm still trying to figure out if this is going to be a weekly feature or not. Hopefully it will be. Let me know what you guys think. Please leave a comment or tweet the show. The contact information is here on the screen. Um, my Twitter handle is at I'm a lunatic. And the email address is I am a lunatic at gmail.com. That's lunatic spell L-U-N-A-R-T-I-C. Thank you very much for listening and tune in next time. I'll do a two Ronnie sign off with it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. Good night. Honest Andy's Discount Moon Show! So we're going to finish on that then. That, uh, yeah, this will inevitably end with a, a clangers based strip bar. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs>